2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 1. And uh, we're going to pick up on our scripture in this series, Josiah's Well, that we've been reading. You've heard it several times now. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father, David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And then if you'll, you'll turn to John chapter 4, verse 14, this is the passage of Scripture where Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. And he interacted with a woman at Jacob's well. And there he said to her, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Turn to your neighbor and say, Never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Man, that sounds good, doesn't it? Amen. We'd like to title this message tonight, The Josiah Effect. The Josiah Effect. Let's pray. Jesus, we need you. We can't do one thing without you, Lord. God, we pray your spirit, that same spirit that raised you up out of that tomb, God, that quickening spirit, your Holy Spirit, Lord, would have its way here tonight to accomplish your perfect will. God, we pray we would have ears to open and hear your word and receive it into our hearts. Let it take root and transform our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. One more time, let's clap our hands and say in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, can we just give him a little bit of praise? Hallelujah, Jesus, we glorify you in this place. Hallelujah. That feels pretty good. If you all stay with me, you can be seated. Jesus described in John chapter 4 and 14 the experience of receiving the initial baptism of the Holy Spirit and becoming a spiritual well springing up into everlasting life. If there was ever a time, a people in history of humanity that needed access to a spiritual well, it was the nation of Judah during King Josiah's reign. And it is you and I here tonight in America. Barna and Impact 360 recently released research findings showing that the percentage of people by generations in America with a biblical worldview. That means they believe the Bible, the fundamental truths in the Bible, is declining with each generation, from the boomers to Generation X to the millennials and now Generation Z. Each generation has shown a decline from 10% to 4%. This is just one more alarming statistic among many. That indicates that America's desperate need for revival is now. A spiritual awakening is needed now in this country. Recent news headlines look like pages out of the book of Revelations. Signs in the heavens. Chinese spy balloons floating over strategic facilities on every continent. Earthquakes in diverse places, Syria and Turkey, suffered several massive earthquakes recently. The death toll is up in the 46,000 souls. Wars, rumors of war, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and ongoing occupation and conflict. NATO's response, deploying a half billion dollars worth of military equipment on the doorstep of the Russian border. What could possibly go wrong with that? Tensions between the three greatest militaries in the history of the world are dangerously high. The moral compass of the majority of our nation's leaders, lawmakers, and educators seem to completely miss the slightest hint of godly wisdom or common sense. They seem to be unified around one common theme, remove us from the favor of God by any and all means necessary. But there's still a, ma a minority resisting the Antichrist agenda, threatening to shred our nation's moral fabric. They definitely need our prayers. Anybody that's serving in a public office that's trying to buck this trend, we, they need our prayers. We need to be praying for our leaders like never before. 
I don't want to bring doom and gloom to this pulpit tonight, but this is reality. These are dark days that we seem to find ourselves in. A couple of weeks back, it, it broke my heart when, when Pastor Mose ministered and he shared conversations that he had had while driving a school bus of elementary kids, asking him, asking him questions like, who is God? How sad. We have access to the world, to the word of God in this country. There are Bibles on our bookshelves, Bibles on the internet, Bible apps on our phone and devices. But unfortunately, the Bible in America is functionally lost. Misplaced in our society today, for the most part, the story of King Josiah discovering a copy of the covenant that Israel had with Moses after being lost for over a generation is hard to imagine. But this country is dangerously close to that state, in my opinion. In this series, we've been talking about revisiting the wells, the well of God's word, the well of revival, wells of spiritual awakening. And last week, we talked about the well of our testimony. I'm ashamed to say, but I've, I've gone through seasons where it's been far too long since I visited the well of my testimony. I'll admit it. The spiritual water source of how God saved me, delivered me, and the many miracles that God has done in my life, in my family's life, and in the lives of my friends. This past weekend, Mona and I were invited to some friends, visit some friends in Texas uh, to attend uh, and celebrate uh, Sister Rebecca Udemark's 80th birthday. She's the wife of Doug Udemark, a retired pastor we worked with some years ago to carve out a church in College Station, Texas. They have a cottage in the woods in Bryan, Texas on part of a farm established in 1927 by the Joseph Burt family. His grandson, Olin Fushak, and his wife, Monica, longtime friends of, of Mona and I, uh, they live just about a few hundred yards away from this cottage that we stayed in. We went over and we visited with them, Olin, and he asked me, he said, if, have you walked down to the creek behind the cottage? And, and I said, uh, yes, I have. He said, well, did you, did you see the old well? And I probably was dumbstruck, uh, look on my face as he was looking at me, uh, you know, and I, he, he's, he's telling me about this, this well. Uh, because I suddenly knew that God had orchestrated our steps for me to see this well. He asked me, did I know what an artesian well was? And I said, yes. And I described the dynamics of an artesian well. He was surprised. Then I confessed that I had recently researched the subject for a message I'd been preaching. He told me that the well marks the spot where his grandmother, Mary Burt, had an old wash pot set up next to the well where she would boil and wash clothes and whatnot. So after our visit, I, we went back to the cottage and I, I walked down behind the cottage and found the old artesian well. And I took a picture of it so that you could see it. That's what it looked like, all covered up. Looks like some hog wire on top of it and uh, maybe an old cattle gap that's supporting all that stuff. It was completely covered up and filled in for the most part, but still had a puddle of water sitting on top of it. And there was a line of wet soil that led, led down the hill to the creek. So you could tell it was still, it was still seeping out water. As I stood there looking at the well, I had one of the Unimark's grandchildren with me, Henry. I think he's about 10. All he knew about the well was that it was dangerous and the kids were to steer clear of it. <laughs> he didn't know the stories of the well, how it got there, what its purpose was. It's been several generations since the well was used at all. Some years back, they had to cover the well to protect curious people from falling into it or, or cattle, cows falling into it. It's kind of sad looking, if you look at it. As I stood there in that moment, looking at that old abandoned well, I instantly knew a couple of things. This was not a coincidence, that God had worked my path to bring me to this well. I knew God wanted to 
Uh, he wanted me to see and understand some things about it. I knew I was looking at a spiritual representation of the condition of our nation, communities, families, even myself at times in my life. I knew God wanted me to encourage us all to get to work on the spiritual wells in our lives. But the question is how? How do we do it? And last Wednesday night in part two, we learned where to start digging. It was the, the well of our testimony. We need to dig down deep and get down to the beginning, that first in, those first encounters with God. Tonight, we'll learn the six things Josiah did that will restore the spiritual well in our lives. These six things created an effect in Josiah's life and in those around him. This effect restored Israel's relationship with their God. I call it the Josiah effect. So for all you process guys and gals out there tonight, you're going to love this. You're going to get it, man, step by step. You want to know how to clean out the spiritual well in your life? Do these six things, and the Josiah effect will begin in your life. You ready? Ask your neighbor, are you ready? Number one, and this is the most important of the six things. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. I could preach all night right here. He, he walked in the ways of his father, David. He did not turn to the right hand, to the left. He did not deviate. Too often, we want to start with everyone else. We have a tendency to sort of look around for a place to start trying to get spiritual things done. And it's everywhere else beside right here. You know, if we, brother so-and-so could get this area straight in his life, man, we could have revival. Man, if the church could do this, we could have revival. If something could happen here or there, this could happen. But I want you to know that you need to take on the Josiah effect. You need to look right inside your soul tonight. And you need to start with the most important thing, and that is personal integrity with God. Doing what is right in the sight of everyone around you. No. Doing what is right in the sight of the Lord. It's amazing what happens when you begin to focus on that. In every area of your life, you're alone with God. You have to get your eyes on your relationship with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit that is inside of you, listening and being sensitive to God and doing in every situation the right thing. Amen? Can somebody say yes? yes. Your pastor has a saying that I love. It's simple. But it's the same exact concept. Do all the things and do them well. Isn't that not correct, staff? Do all the things and do them well. Nick Saban was, has been the head coach for Alabama since 2007. Boo. He has four national championships and one of only two coaches to win two national college football championships from two different SEC uh, schools. Thank you. An achievement that he shares with Bear Bryant. Pretty good company. I'm still a little bitter about him leaving LSU. I don't know about some of y'all. In an interview, he described what he tells prospective recruits that, that want to play for Alabama. And of course, everybody wants to play for Alabama. He says, excellence at Alabama is not good enough. You must be an elite player to play for this team. This is a conversation that he's having with a prospective recruit. Then he asked them, are you willing to do whatever it takes to be an elite athlete? To strive for something beyond excellence? Do you think you can perform at the elite level? He said that he believes consistently winning in the SEC begins with this conversation with every player on the team. I thought that was pretty interesting. If folks can get that serious about playing football, what if we got that serious about living for God? What if we got that serious about the next level in our relationship with God? To go from being just excellent to being an elite. 
man of God, an elite woman of God, an elite church, an elite experience. Josiah was willing to do what was right in the sight of the Lord, elite character, willingness to do all the things and do them all well. Looking at the next thing that must be done, looking for the next thing that must be improved until it is done well, doing right in the sight of of the Lord. I just wonder if you're getting it or if is it just passing through as some cliche that you've heard before. Listen to me. It's not enough to do what everybody thinks is the right thing to do. You got to get in, in the position where you're doing the right thing in the sight of God. And that might be very unpopular. It might cause you to go against the grain. It might cause you to have to swim up current against a lot of traffic. That's good. That's good. Number two, the second thing that you must do. He began to seek the God of his father, David. Every spiritual awakening, every spiritual revival in the history of the church began with worshiping in spirit and in truth. True worship undergirded by prayer and continual repentance, sanctifying yourself in the presence of God. That is what truly seeking God is. To be an apostolic church, to be an apostolic person, you have to go back to where this thing was born on the day of Pentecost. They were all in one accord and in one place, and they were all seeking for revival. There was a worship that was undergirding what they were doing. There was prayer. There was worship. There was repentance. There was positioning. There was unity. And then came the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And it is that way in the life of every individual that comes to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. You've got to get in a position of worship and praise. You've got to seek the God of David. You've got to seek God and seek him well. Seek him. Seek him. Somebody say seek him. Number three, he purged his life of all forms of idolatry. Now I'm going to get down in, in the weeds with you here just a little bit. He purged his life of all forms of idolatry. You see, to get down deep, you have to tear down what's high. The high places have to come down. All the kings prior to Josiah never dealt with the wickedness that was happening on the high places. When you come out in the city of Jerusalem and look at the horizon, you would see elevated places. And on every one of those high places was an idol. And there was all kinds of idolatrous practices that were sexual in nature and sensual in nature. And they never would deal with those situations because they were afraid of what might happen. Maybe the kingdom might break apart. Maybe there'd be a revolt. Maybe those people would rise up against and they wouldn't tolerate it but Josiah did not care he knew it was the right thing to do and he went after those high places and he pulled down those high places and he destroyed them when you'd walk out in the city of Jerusalem, you'd look up on the high places, you'd see those images, and there was a reputation, there were stories, and people knew what was taking place up there. And so you'd just walk in around in Jerusalem, and you'd look up at those high places, and instantly, images would come in your mind of things that you'd heard about what they were doing up there in those places. That stuff had to be dealt with. That stuff had to be torn down. Second Kings 23 and 19, and all the houses also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger, Josiah took away and did to them according to all the acts that he had done in Bethel. For you and I, it is the mediums through which idolatry is introduced into our minds. Sin that is of a sexual, sensual nature are in the high places of our culture today. Everywhere you look, in every communication medium, it is being fire-hosed with seductive images into our thoughts. 
If you're struggling with these high places, the only way to deal with them is to remove it from your life. Dabbling in it will stop the Holy Ghost well from flowing in your life. It will stop revival. It will stop spiritual awakening in your life. It will fill up your well with guilt and grief. It will affect every close relationship in your life. You've got to deal with the high places. Do I need to get real specific? I don't think I do. I think everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about. If you have to. If you will decide and determine tonight to tear down those high places, I promise you the well will flow again in your life and give you power to remove sexual idolatry from the high places in your minds. Every excuse. Every justification for sin that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. It is a high place in your mind. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I'm preaching tonight about tearing the high places down. And bring him into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is some Josiah stuff. Josiah would be after that stuff. He has, I, I feel the Holy Ghost right now dealing with some, some stuff. I want you to know if God's dealing with you tonight, when this altar opens up, I want you to know God can relieve you. God can heal you. God can touch you. God can deliver you. If you'll just repent of that stuff, God will cleanse you and the flow will begin to get again in your life. The fourth thing, he was instrumental in the restoration and operation of the house of God. If you love the house of God, could you just say, I love you, Jesus? Oh, I love the house of God. I love the house of God. You got to have a heart for the house of God. And Josiah, he went to work on the house of God. He inspired. He provided. He took care of everything, uh, procuring everything, and making sure that they had everything to restore any part of the house of God that was dysfunctional or not operating according to the covenant of Moses. We got to get involved with the house of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, join a group. Turn to your other neighbor and say, join the dream team. Fall in love with the house of God. Don't just show up here and then leave and, and just forget about the house of God. Think about the house of God. Long for the house of God. Wonder what could possibly be done at the house of God. How can we pull together and work for the house of God? What can we do to have a spiritual awakening? What can we do to help pastor, help the dream team, help staff to do anything on this in this place that we can bring the presence of God and have revival and see souls saved? Have a heart for the house of God. If you have a heart for the house of God, there's going to be a well flowing in your life, I promise you. There will be a spiritual awakening in your family. Your children need to have a love for the house of God, and they will only get it when they see it and feel it from their parents. Somebody say, house, heart for the house. The fifth thing Josiah did that you must do, he cultivated a tender heart and a spirit of humility towards God. Oh, this is so important. That made him responsive whenever the word of God finally came to him. And that prophet read, that, read the word of God to him. The Bible says he tore his clothes. He fell on his face and tears began to pour out of him as he wept over his condition and his nation. Oh, what a response. That comes from cultivating a tender heart toward God. A, po a posture of worship, prayer, and repentance cultivates a tenderness toward God. 
1 Timothy 4 and 4, and now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You need to stop listening to that junk that the world has. You need to be able to discern lies from the enemy that comes to discourage, and you need to just turn away from what's being spoken by the world and by the enemy so that you can cultivate a tenderness toward God. Begin speaking and, and staying away from, uh, from these lies that are speaking hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The more you resist the Holy Ghost, your conscience becomes damaged. You need to value your conscience. Conscience is not valued in this culture today. Conscience will be destroyed and seared if you allow this world to continue to speak and, and operate in your life. Your conscience will be seared with a hot iron. And when that happens, it scabs over and it scars over. And you can poke that all you want. You won't even feel it. I've got a scar on my ankle that I received when I was a teenager just uh, on a motorcycle. And uh, it created a big scar, uh, scab on my ankle. And I can poke that place today and I can't feel it. That's what will happen to your conscience. If you continue to neglect when God says you need to come back, you need to stay away from that, you need to separate yourself from that. When you feel that, when you hear that, you need to respond to that. And the quicker you respond to it, the quicker you take action, the quicker you obey God's spirit, it will tenderize your heart toward God. Don't expect God to just keep on telling you to not do that. And you just keep on neglecting and keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. Come back to God. Repent of that. Stop that. Move in a different direction. Pull back away from that. Number six, he inquired of the Lord. Josiah, after he heard the word of God for the first time in his life, he tore his clothes and he wept before God. He didn't stop there. I told you last Wednesday night that he intensified his efforts to connect and communicate with God. You can't be a yo-yo. You know, you fall away, and then you come back. Fall away, and then you come back. That's what a yo-yo does. Raise your hand if you know what a yo-yo is. Fall away, come back. Fall away, come back. Man, we need to be consistent. If there's ever a time to intensify your relationship with God, don't be a yo-yo. Get in the presence of God. Get these six things going in your life and be consistent in your communication with God. Intensify your relationship. Seek God. Inquire of God and establish a walk with him that is alive and flowing with joy into your life and those around you. Be that person that everybody wants to be around and not that person that everybody wants to run from. Raise your hand if you're that person. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 19 and 20. Now, I've always wondered about myself because I talk to myself. Does anybody out there talk to yourself? It's when you start answering yourself is when it becomes a problem. Come see me if you start doing that. Ephesians chapter 5 and 19, I got scripture for it. Speaking to yourselves, Paul said to the Ephesian church, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I love, one thing I love about Mona, she, she's always making melody in her heart. If I just kind of follow her around, she don't know I'm following her. She's got some little tune humming. I'll say, baby, what, are you, what is that song? It's some song she's singing. It's, it's a song. It's a song. It's talking to ourselves, encouraging ourselves. And your, your, your pastor's wife, Sister Jen, she does it all the time. You just say a word and she'll start singing a tune, man. It's amazing. She's singing on the inside. She's worshiping up here. She's singing, but she's singing everywhere she goes. I love it. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul continues. Six things. If you'll get these things going in your life, I promise you, stuff will start happening. Exciting things. So let's recap. For all you melancholies out there, you, you didn't get it all down. You want to fill in the gaps. Number one, doing right in the sight of the Lord. Number two, begin seeking God. 
Number three, get the idolatry out of your life and keep it out of your life. Number four, have a heart for the house. Number five, nurture sensitivity. Protect your conscience. Number six, inquire of the Lord. Talking to God. He will respond. And your life will be guided and led by the Holy Spirit. What could be better? Oh, I'm telling you. You want the joy of your salvation? Are you in a rut of gloom and you need to get out of that, man. You need the joy of the Lord. I've known many people through the years that I, I could clearly see the Josiah effect working in their life, whether they knew about the way I presented it or not. But one of them is, was James Kilgore, who pastored Life Tabernacle in Houston, Texas, and served the UPCI in many official capacities during his lifetime. The Lord brought to mind a couple of memories or moments I had with him uh, to share with you tonight. So our musicians can get ready to come. He was the son of Brother C.P. Kilgore, one of 10 kids. His father began preaching in 1919. C.P. Kilgore had pioneered 15 churches and baptized over 10,000 souls in the name of Jesus Christ. Wow. The first memory that I had with Brother Kilgore that I wanted to share with you is something Brother Kilgore used to say about gaining assurance that, that we're being led by God. He used to say, when the Holy Spirit is in it, it'll have a ring to it. I've, I've always remembered that. And I've experienced that. For example, us, Mona and I, winding up at an old artesian well in Bryan, Texas, through no effort of my own, while preaching this series on Josiah's well. It's just got a ring to it. You see what I'm saying? When you're being led by the Spirit of God, God puts his signature on things. He gives a response. It's not, God could talk to you in an audible voice. He's God. But many times, it's a word that comes to you as you're reading God's word or in prayer or somebody shares something with you or something happens and it just is an endorsement of the leading of God's spirit and it's got a ring to it. It's got a harmony to it. Amen. I hope tonight that the direction you're taking, that God is, is reciprocating as he's leading you. Psalms 24 and 1 says, the earth. This is the hope I want to give you tonight. There's nothing that can stop your God. It don't matter how dark it gets or what Washington, D.C. does. It doesn't matter. They think they're it on a stick. You know, they're not in control. God is in control. I'm not trying to be disrespectful or anything like that. The Bible says to honor those that have the rule over you. Pray for them. But they don't have control. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. It doesn't matter who's in control or how dark it is. When God gets ready to move, when he gets ready to have revival in your soul or in your family or in this church, he doesn't need any cooperation from anything. He can do it because he owns the earth and he owns you. He is God. When God gets ready to move, there's no stopping him. The wells will break forth and his spirit will flow throughout the land. Amen. Y'all feeling what I'm feeling? The second memory is something I heard him say in prayer. I had the opportunity back in the late 80s to attend Life Tabernacle, and, and uh, I would get up early in the morning and drive a couple of times a week to the church and pray. And Brother Kilgore would be there. Uh, he prayed from 5.30, around 5.30 to 6.30 in the morning and uh, d during that season of his life. And I would, I would have to get there early because I had to be back for my job. And so a couple of times a week for about six months, I, I was able to, to be right close within proximity hearing of him praying. 
And I heard him say this many times and I, and as he prayed, and I, it always would come, will come back to me from time to time. And it, it definitely came back to me as I was preparing for this series. I heard him say many times, spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Oh well, spring up. And only the way his boys could say it. And what was he doing? He was, he was trying to stir up the Holy Spirit well of his heritage. Probably as a child traveling from town to town, preaching revivals with his father, 10,000 souls baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, 15 churches established, and his accomplishments in his ministry. What a great man of God. He was stirring up the Holy Ghost inside of him. He was saying, come on, Holy Spirit, stir up inside of me. Come on, Holy Spirit, start flowing again, once again. Let the revival rivers flow out of me and into this church that I have the responsibility to pastor. That's what he was doing when he would say, spring up, oh well, spring up, oh well. Why don't we all stand? I know, I know what God wants to do here, the things he wants to accomplish here. There's always more that God could do. Sometimes he's limited by our response, but I'll tell you some things that I do know in praying for this service. I know that in our culture, we struggle with these high places that I described. And so I want to give an opportunity for anyone who's struggling with these high places to come and to keep you from being embarrassed. I want anybody that wants to come to just pray a protection around your, your heart and mind and those hearts and minds of your family, your children, I want you to come too. That way, nobody will be embarrassed. Say, oh man, look at them. They, they're struggling with that stuff. No, no, we need to just, we just need to come in, in, into the presence of God and just with an open heart, just begin to pour out in repentance. Don't leave anything undone. Just begin to pour it out to God. Get everything right that's not right with God. Get it all straightened out. Have a little talk with Jesus, and he'll make it all right. Just have a little talk with Jesus, and he'll wash your sins whiter than snow. He'll take his finger and dip it in that blood and pass it over your mistakes, pass it over your failures, pass it over your problems, and deliver you with his powerful spirit. And let that river of living water begin to flow out of your life tonight. Oh, can we just make a decision tonight that we're going to get the Josiah effect going in our lives and just see the glory of God manifest in our lives and in our families, in our church, in our community. Can we pray? Can we lift our voices to the Lord? Right where you're at, just begin to confess to God. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God, that I haven't been everything that I should be. I'm sorry I've just been an average Christian, Lord. What you did on Calvary requires me to go to the next level. I want to be greater than even excellent, God. I want to be, I want to move to that elite level, God. Guide me and lead me with your spirit, God. Let that river of living water flow out of me tonight. Come on. Come on. Stir up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Come on, Holy Ghost well. Flow tonight. Flow tonight. Rahasha Rabba Dororo Sarava Rabba Rabahaya. Oh, Holy Ghost, well. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Have your way. Have your way in your, the lives of your people, Jesus. Deliver us, oh God. Make us strong, God. Rahasha Rabba Dorahaya. In the name of Jesus Christ, deliver God. In Jesus' name. Just reach over and. Put your hand on a person if it's appropriate next to you. Just pray for them. Oh, God, deliver us, oh, God. Oh, God, get the Josiah effect going in their life, Lord. Let the well of rivering water flow. Help us to find Josiah's well. Glory, high and lifted up, your 
Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.com. Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you could download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.